Father in heaven, I do thank you again for this day of life and your love. But Lord, I thank you for the traveling mercy you allowed me to have. And Lord, me getting older and everything, it's hard to even navigate anymore. But I thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for me and given me and directed my path up there and back. And I just pray, Lord, that some of the things I shared up there on the gospel, Lord, it would uh, take root. And just pray, Lord, that your will would be done in each one of their lives. I ask you to be with my brother Tim Buchanan. Lord, that you would help him with the circumstance and the infection in his toe. And pray, Lord, that they'd uh, get a hold of that where something wouldn't uh, take place where he has to have it removed. But, Lord, that you just heal it. Your will would be done in his life as well with each one of us. Help him to stay on his diet and help him, Lord, to take the medicine he should take as well. But, Lord, I ask you to be with our service this evening and be with Rod as you bring forth something that we can, again, take in and learn uh, more about your wills and ways. And I just ask the Lord to just bless this offering, bless those who give, those who cannot. All these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 <coughs> Test. There it is. Yes. <laughs> well, welcome to another Wednesday night. It's good to see y'all. Miss y'all. Miss some of y'all that wasn't here. Um, can you turn it down just a little bit? Just a little. Thank you. All right. Charlie. So I just want to say that this week was an awesome week of study for me. And, uh, as I was studying, um, something came to my mind that has, has frequently came to my mind, but I really haven't pondered on it or meditated on it a lot. Uh, the fact is, is that's a, it's an amazing privilege to say anything out of this book. It's an amazing privilege to think that a single little mind like mine, that the all supreme mind looks down on my mind, this little thing, and worries about me, cares about me, yeah. and lets me say anything about him. So while I was doing the study this week, I was, um, um, the Holy Spirit was moving me, and I hope that what I've presented here, uh, that you guys will take as much away from it as I did. So can you turn it down a little bit? No? That's pretty loud. I know, I'll see what's going on. It's pretty loud. So this week, I first want to start off with a word about Bible study. When we first came in, what was it, January that I first started? Um, I started trying, trying my best to teach you guys how to Bible study. So I was breaking things down and, you know, telling you about the different nuances going through and getting the situation and getting the background and all these things. And I think it's an important thing. We also, as we started this study on uh, Thessalonians, I brought out the maps and the atlas, you know, and, and things like that to, to help us along. But I want to say something else, and y'all heard me say this before, but I think this man says it better than me. C.S. Lewis, we talked about him before. Um, we talked about how he may have been in some controversial relationships, uh, but C.S. Lewis is a very good writer. He's very imaginative. We know that he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, and uh, he has a lot of great things to say. 
But a little history lesson before we start. C.S. Lewis, the, re the reason I wrote Athanasius up there. Who knows who Athanasius is? Who's ever heard of him? Okay, Athanasius was the 20th bishop of Alexandria, Egypt. 296 to 373, that's when he lived. Uh, who's heard of Arius? Anybody? Anybody? Council of Nicaea, who's heard of that? <laughs> okay. Well, the Council of Nicaea was, was put on by um, Constantine, Emperor Constantine. And what he did was he brought all the bishops of the known world, he brought them in, and they were going to try to figure out who the Lord Jesus Christ was, his essence, what he was. And there was a man named Arius who came along, and they called him a heretic. At the time, they called him a heretic because he said that the Lord Jesus Christ was not the Son of God. He was not divine. He was not of the essence of God. He was a created being by God. And so they labeled him a heretic. Athanasius was one of the bishops that was there. And he's the one that he's one of the ones that signed the Nicene Creed. Arius signed it as well. And after Arius had signed it, Constantine ordered Athanasius to take him back into the fold, even though he said that Lord Jesus Christ was a created being, that he wasn't God. And Athanasius refused. When he refused, he got charged with murder and taxation and all these different charges, and he got exiled. But there is, he has a, a writing called On the Incarnation. If you get a chance to read it, it's awesome. Athanasius was an excellent writer, and when I was reading his writings, the, the amount of capitalization, I don't know if y'all have read when every time you write something about the Lord Jesus or God, you'll see it in the Bible, or you'll see something like, uh, you'll see, and himself. You see that has capitalized with a big H? Everything about God, right, was capitalized in the Bible or anywhere else. Most of the things that Athanasius is writing about, everything's capitalized because that's what he's, that's how much he's talking about God and the Lord Jesus. He, he was a very, uh, a very good man. But C.S. Lewis made a comment about Athanasius, and this is what he said. And I've talked to y'all about this before, but he says it better. C.S. Lewis says this. Naturally, since I myself am a writer, I do not wish the ordinary reader to read no modern books. But if he must read only the new or only the old, I would advise him to read the old. And I would give him this advice precisely because he is an amateur and therefore much less protected than the expert against the dangers of an exclusive contemporary diet. A new book is still on its trial, and the amateur is not in a position to judge it. It has to be tested against the great body of Christian thought down the ages, and all its hidden implications, often unsuspected by the author himself, have to be brought to light. Often, it cannot be fully understood without the knowledge of a good many other modern books. Remarks which seem to you very ordinary will produce laughter and irritation, and you will not see why. In the same way, sentences in a modern book which look, like, which look quite ordinary may be directed at some other book. In this way, you may be led to accept what you would have in, indignant, indignantly rejected if you knew its real significance. The only safety is to have a standard of plain, central Christianity, which puts the controversies of the moment in their proper perspective. Such a standard can be acquired only in the old books. It is a good rule after reading a new book never to allow yourself another new one until you've read an old one in between. Why do I say that? Because the people of old, y'all know that I read 18, uh, 1900s and before. That's what I like to read. Why? Because they knew how to study the Bible. They had quiet time. They had meditation time. They, they did have distractions, but they didn't have the distractions we have. And you, there was, there's a lot of Good men of God who have walked the path of Bible study, you know, and been in the Holy Spirit, that when they're studying, you can read them and go, wow. I mean, this is much different than what I'm reading. I'm, I'm going to read y'all a modern book. That's, that's got a good quote in it, but it's nothing like, it's nothing like the old people. And Athanasius is one of those. So the reason I said that is because as we do these Bible studies and as we take this information home, I would like you, when you're studying, when you're going back to the commentaries, if you do go to the commentaries, to make sure that you get the oldest that you can get. Because the older, the better. All right? 
So review from last week. If you were here last week, we went over the second and half of the third chapter of 1 Thessalonians, if you want to turn there. 1 Thessalonians. So we're going to pick up the review from last week. Talk a little bit about it. Paul was anxious to go back to Thessalonica. We know that he had been kicked out from Berea. He went down to Athens, and then he went to Corinth, and he wrote this letter from Corinth. While he was there, or while he was in Athens, he sends Timothy back to get a report in Thessalonica. When he comes back to Corinth to give Paul the report, Paul sees all the issues and all the questions that the Thessalonians have, and he writes them a letter answering a lot of their questions. But for the most part, he's telling them that Timothy brought back a good report, and he's glad that you guys are still you guys still remember me, and I'm thankful, you know, that you guys are going through persecution and faith and staying uh, committed to the Lord Jesus. And so we'll start at verse chapter three, verse ten. Paul says, "Night and day, praying exceedingly, that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking of your faith." We talked last week about. Praying night and day, pray without ceasing. Paul always expressed that people need to pray without ceasing. And when we talk about Paul right here, when he's talking about praying night and day, who thinks he was on his knees 24 hours a day, night and day? Anybody? No, right? He was in a constant state of prayer, yeah. mind, body, soul, <laughs> spirit. He was always thinking about the people that he had preached the gospel to, the people that he had cared about. He was constantly uh, talking to God about them in his mind and in his heart. That's what he's talking about. And I want this board right here I put up so I can kind of gather my thoughts, but I'll kind of skip around here because uh, I missed a part right here. But um, that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now, we haven't talked about this much, but I want to talk about it tonight. The cause for Paul's writing. Who can tell me what faith is? <laughs> this is a, a very, very, I'm not going to say hard, but it's very deep. Okay, who can tell me where the definition of faith is found in the Bible? Okay. Hebrews. Okay. Anybody? Hebrews 11.1. Hebrews 11.1. Let's turn there. I want to show y'all something very cool. Hebrews 11, 1. Can somebody read that? Hebrews 11, 1. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. The word substance. Take it here. I don't mess it up. The word substance. Y'all remember when we were breaking down Greek words? This is hypostasis. This is substance. Now I want y'all to watch this. Who, can, who thinks they know what the word sub means? The prefix sub. If I was to say subterranean or substandard or uh, submarine, what does the word sub mean? Under. Under. All right, that's the same word as this, pupo, which is under. Stasis means to stand. Or a standing. Stance means to stand. So the word substance, a lot of people get confused on that. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the understanding of things hoped for. And the understanding 
of the evidence of things not seen. That's what faith is. Have y'all ever seen it been put that way? So a lot of people get confused on this. Now, faith, we talked about this a little bit. Faith and belief are the same word in the Greek. They're this word, pistis, they come from the same word. Faith is the noun, belief is the verb. Faith is the thing, that's what we do, or that's, that is the thing that we are doing. We are, the verb is believing, this is the action. Right? So as Paul is saying in 1 Thessalonians, he's saying that we might perfect that which is lacking in your faith, in your understanding of the evidence of things not seen. The we want to make sure that we perfect the lack of things that are um, the substance, the understanding. So he's trying to perfect their understanding, okay? That's what it's about. Now, continuing on, I want to... We're going to skip through a lot of these because a lot of these are self-explanatory. Verse 11. And now God himself and our Lord Jesus, I'm sorry, and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. Now, we see right here that Paul obviously has tell, told the Thessalonians about the triune God. He's told them about the Godhead. How do you know that? He says... God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Now, he's talking to the Thessalonians. We talked about them worshiping all these gods and idols. Do you think that if Paul, do you think that Paul would have wrote to the Thessalonians knowing that they worship all these kind of gods? Do you think he would have wrote to them three different names for God if he didn't? teach them about the triune God. He probably would have, or if I was writing it, I would definitely not write pagans that because they are pantheists or they're polytheists. They believe in all kinds of gods. So if I said this and this and this, they would have thought that it was three different gods. So obviously we know that he was teaching them the triune God. Verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. And toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to go over the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ until next week, which is a very interesting subject in itself. But we talked about this two weeks ago. Perusia. Anybody, anybody remember that, what that word is? Perusia. But it's the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord. And it's actually, it actually means presence. Physical presence of the Lord. Now, a couple of verses about the coming of the Lord. We're not going to go in real depth into it. But yes, sir. The lyric says there where Paul teaches the God at. Now that's, that is saying... That is the true God. Is that is that what the Godhead means? The God, the Godhead is the is that is what the Bible. The, the Trinity is not in the Bible. The name Trinity is not in the Bible. Right. It's the same thing as the Godhead: okay. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I, mean, I see that all the time in there. Well, you know, Godhead. Godhead yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the term that's used in the Bible. Trinity is not. Okay. So, Jude fourteen talks about the coming of the Lord, and he says. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. So Jude is talking about this event right here. And when we get into the study of the coming of the Lord, there's a lot of different views about how the Lord's coming, when he's coming, uh, if he's coming pre-trib or post-trib or mid-trib or how many people he's, you know, there's all kind of views about the coming of the Lord. We'll talk about that next week a little bit more. But for this specific verse, we know, because it's this word parousia, that he's talking about the physical second coming, meaning coming here back to earth. All right? And Jude is talking about the same thing when he's saying that he's coming back with ten thousands of his saints. And in there, he says he got it from Enoch. Enoch said, and that's from... 
First Enoch 1 9, he says the same thing. Behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all. So that's not the rapture. Like, you know, that's the second coming. Now, moving on. Chapter 4. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how we ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. Verse 2. For you know what I command for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Now, right here, Paul is reminding the Thessalonians of the command. He's about to start reminding them of the, of the commandments that he has given them by the Lord Jesus. Now, what's important about reminding God's people of the commandments? Well, for one, we find it all through Scripture. We find memorials all through Scripture. Numbers 15, 38, Deuteronomy, where Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 God tells the children of Israel that they need to put his word on the doorway and the walls. And Numbers 15, we see he tells the priest to put blue ribbon on their priestly garments so they can remember the commandments of God. Why is it that you think God does this, constantly reminds his people of his commandments? Who thinks they can answer that? I mean, uh, in my opinion, it's because if we aren't constantly reminded of God and of God's commandments, then we forget about them. Okay. We disobey. Okay. And we That's fall away. Right. And that, you see it over and over and over and over in the Old Testament. Now, I wrote a guy named Philip Carey. He wrote this book, Good News for Anxious Christians. It's a new book. But he says something pretty interesting in here that goes along with this. And what he's talking about is the heart. God reminds his people of his commandments over and over and over because the heart can get pulled away. It can get pulled this way and pulled that way. And this is what he says. One of the most important things to know about the voices of our heart is that like our hearts themselves, they are formed to a large degree by what comes from the outside of them. This is why it's so important to hear the word of God properly preached. And to take it into your heart so that faith, hope, and love may take shape there. For our culture contains all sorts of voices that want to shape the voices of your heart. That's what the mass media and consumerism is all about. So he goes into consumerism and mass media and things like that. But it's an important verse or an important paragraph because he's exactly right. What happens is, is that all the outside influences, whether it be... Uh, Let's just say all the outside influences, besides the word of God, will come into your heart, will come into your mind, and that, those things will cloud his commandments. They will cloud them. Now, when it comes to the heart, this is exactly how the falling away, y'all heard of the falling away in 2 Thessalonians, is going to happen. People are going to fall away from the faith because other things are going to creep in. Now, what's interesting about this, and I wanted to put this up here, and we've talked about this one time before, but the word falling away is apostasis. Now, I want you all to watch this. The word apo means removal. Now, this is one thing that God doesn't want to happen. That's why he continues to remind us of his word and of his commandments, because the falling away, we're about to see, is a removal of the stasis. And we've seen up here, stasis is the standard, the firm standard, or establishment, right? So the apostasis is going to be a removal of firm standing or establishment on the word of God. That's what it is. Now what's interesting about this too, if we continue to go on, staros makes up stasis, and star stareo makes up staros. This word staros is the word cross. Jesus died on a cross. And this word star, star eo is crucified. There will be a removal of the establishment of words God, I mean the word of God, a removal of the cross 
and a, room, a removal to crucify the flesh. That's the falling away. How does that happen? The heart gets changed. That's what happens. Outside influence gets in, and that's why we need to raise our children, putting the word of God on the walls and on the doorways. You see. Continuing on. Now he's going to start to name these commandments. Verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. We're going to stop right there. Who can tell me what sanctification is? Now, this is a big word. And you hear it all the time. But not a whole lot of people can tell you what it is. Who thinks they can tell you what it is? All right. Purified. Purified. Watch this. You're right. We're going to break it down a little further than that. Hagiosmos. That's this word right here. Sanctification in the Greek. It means the effects of purification. It comes from the word hagiazo, which is to consecrate to God. And it stems from the word hagios, which means holy. And it means saint. Every time you see the word saint. So what purification is, is the process by which the saints consecrated to God are purified. That's what sanctification is. Now, we did a study on the tabernacle. And I tell you, it was this long of a class, and I tried to fit everything in. Probably not smart, <laughs> because it's a lot of stuff. So we're going to isolate it tonight. And I drew an awesome picture up here, right? It's pretty awesome. So, who can tell me, this arrow right here, who can tell me what this is? In the tabernacle, in the wilderness. Anybody? Say again. Not the Ark of the Covenant. Not the Ark of the Covenant. This is the Ark of the Covenant right here. In the Holy of Holies. Anybody? It's not that gold labor or what is it? What is it? Brazen labor. <laughs> the brazen labor. Or they call it the brazen seed. Who can tell me what it's for? Yes. Uh, wasn't it for washing uh, before entering into the uh, Holy of Holies? Right? The, the Holy Place. Oh, the Holy Place. Yeah. Yes. So, and I put, what is, who is it for? Who is it for? <laughs> high priest. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. The priest. The high priest, let me just, I want to clarify a few things. Priests. All the priests could come into the holy place. Only the high priest could go behind the veil to the most holy place one time a year. Now, this is the brazen labor. Jonathan's right. It was for washing the hands and feet of the priest before they entered in into the holy place. Now, if we understand, we have to understand that when we do Bible study and we Look at the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament. That the Old Testament is the shadow. And the New Testament is the very image. Alright? So we look in Hebrews. Hebrews is the perfect book to get an understanding of this. It takes you back and forth. And you go back and forth. But everything, literally everything... Points to the Lord Jesus. <laughs> I mean, there's hardly anything that doesn't point to the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. And so what you have to do is you have to go through and read slowly and then find where it becomes the very image and how it does, how it applies in the New Testament. And that's how you get to understand it. So the brazen labor is for washing the hands and the feet of the priest. Now, here's what's interesting about this. 
Everything on the outside of the tabernacle, we're not going to do a tabernacle class, but I want to clarify a few things. Everything on the outside was considered the world, dead people. All right, they were dead. When they came in here, they came in through the door. Who's the door? I am the door. Right? And so they'd come in through the door, and they came to the altar of burnt offering. Right? And so they would sacrifice the unblemished lamb who was Jesus. Jesus. And when they would sacrifice the unblemished lamb, then they would come here, they would wash, and they would then enter into the Holy of Holies. Right? So what this is a picture of is justification. You are justified before you are sanctified. And the holy place is a picture of the spiritual kingdom of God. You're justified, you're sanctified, and you enter into the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom. Inside the spiritual kingdom of God, what do we have? We have the menorah, which is the light, the illumination. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. We have the table of showbread. The table of showbread is, was actually called the food of God. And that's actually, Jesus says, I am the bread of life, the bread from heaven, right? That's a picture of him. And the incense, the altar of incense in which he is intercessing for us. All the spiritual things. So, this brazen altar is a picture of sanctification. All right? Of washing. I said when I did this class that most Christians are right here. In this spot, right in the middle. Because they get justified, and then that's it. I'm good to go. And they're just walking along in the wilderness. But we should aim, we should be calling out to God, crying out to God, to wash us, to sanctify us. And it goes much deeper than that, but that's the quick and dirty and down of it. But I want to show you, and I want you to turn there, where Jesus talks about sanctification. John 17, 17. actually what sanctifies us so as Paul is saying the will of God is that you are sanctified you see right here that Jesus tells you how you are sanctified he says in verse 17 sanctify them as he's, this is his prayer uh, to God sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth so how are we sanctified through the word of God verse 19 and for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. Whose word? This is Jesus talking. The apostles. The apostles. And that's what brings us back to Paul. Yes. But you know, through it all, it's self-serving and most Say that again. You're saying that people are saying they're saved, but they don't go out and witness. Right. So it's kind of a self-serving, but they, that's about as far as a lot of Christians go today because they don't go out and witness to others. But it's, you know, we're supposed to love others like God loves us or Christ loves us. But that's as far as it goes. Once we accept Christ, most people do not go out and tell the love of Christ so they can be saved. Well, that's true. Uh, but... Here's why I think they don't. We are, we are totally biblically illiterate today. The people are. I mean, the churches, the way they are presenting the word of God is not, like I said, with the old people, right? The old books and the old preaching. It's not the same, right? It's very watered down. And so we talked about accept Christ. We talked about a lot of things in here, all right? A lot of uh, um, non-Baptist doctrine, not doctrine but a lot of non-baptist things you don't hear it in the baptist church and a lot of people do think that they're saved 
but they're actually not. It's an emotional thing. They come in here, they get emotionally pumped up, they walk out into the world, and then they're the same person, you see? And they have no idea about the Word of God. And I think that's the one reason that a lot of people don't go with this. For one, some people ain't comfortable with it. They're scared, or, you know, they fear, um, or they just don't know anything about it and they're not really saved. Yes? Um, I'd say like that uh, is really true. Uh, before I got saved, uh, like just while I was in high school or whatever, I'd have uh, friends who would be Christians and I'd ask them like a question and be like, you know, what is, exactly is the Holy Spirit? And I never had any Christian who could tell me what the Holy Spirit was. Mm. And I mean, we're going off a little bit, but I, I got a question in one of my classes a couple months ago that asked me, do do you have to know Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and all their, everything that those three are about in their offices and the things that they do as separate, as not separate, the, their jobs and their purposes to be saved? No. You don't need to know, but when you are told or read, you will believe. Yes, sir. A true salvation experience brings you to that. Yes, sir. And I, there was many answers. It was a discussion. There was many answers. Some people said, yeah, well, yes, they do. And some people said, no, I mean, uh, it's the Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit leads you to the Lord Jesus. And so you need to know. And then after that, you can learn all the other stuff, you know. And I tend to, to go that way, too. And so if you have a Christian who says, well, I don't know everything about the Holy Spirit, you know, I, I don't think that's a really big issue. But if they can't tell you about the Lord Jesus and what he's done in their life, then you gotta assume that they are not saved. So, you know, I think though a, a lot is, you know, they'll take uh, the Bible out of concept. You know, like they'll say, "Oh, the Lord says in Romans uh, ten nine about confess thy mouth towards the second with thy heart, thou shalt be saved." Yep. Or, you know, or I think that's in what is that Romans ten nine. That it, it says that. Yep. In, in Romans uh, ten ten, who shall ever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes. They don't look into the fact. They say, "What does He really say?" If you're saved, and how do you live your life to do that? And they don't go to that part. Mm -hmm. They don't want to. They didn't, they didn't want to hear it because I'm saved. That's good enough for me. Right. And we, we, uh, we're going off. But we talked about the message is, is uh, being watered down that they are not. A lot of preachers are not going into detail of when they say call upon the name of the Lord. Well, we see if you continue to go on down in, in Romans 10, you'll see that it says. That you're not going to call on a God that you don't believe in. That's right. And how are you going to believe in him if you don't hear the word? Yes. And you see and how. So you're not going to call on a God that you don't believe in. That's right. You see. So um, the message is not the same. And the, the message also about crucifying self is not there. The taking up your daily cross is not there today. They're just not preaching these things. And so as they go out into the world. They get the emotional experience. They go out to the world and they have no idea about cruci crucifying self. They just go hang out with the same people they did. And um, it, it's, it's obvious. The Lord Jesus says that you'll be able to tell them by their fruits. And if their fruits are they leave church and they go to the bar, then we have to suspect something. Let's continue on. We went off on a, on a tangent there. The Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost all the same. They are one God, three distinct persons. Did I say that right, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Three distinct persons. Well, we, we need to do a study on the Trinity because I, I think a lot of people are hazy about the Trinity, about the Godhead. I mean, um, you hear it a lot, but as far as digging deep into it and really getting an understanding, we need to do a study on that. So let's continue on. So we stopped at verse 3, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should, okay, so sanctification we know is the washing of God. God's going to wash us. And we know that the, the brazen labor, the washing was for the priests. Now let me ask you a question. Is a born-again Christian a priest? Yeah. He is? Anybody else? <laughs> Anybody? Priest of the believer. Let's turn to Revelation 5.10 right quick. <clears throat> 5.10. 5.10. 
5, we'll start at verse 9. <clears throat> Revelation 5, 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Who's it talking about? Who are they praising? Jesus. Right. Out of every kindred, every tongue, people, and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. The born again Christian is a priest. Now, that's <laughs> a hard thing for a lot of people to, to get. But if we go back and realize that everything in the Old Testament is a shadow of things to come. In the New Testament, we are living in the spirit. This, is, this was natural, physical Israel. This is spiritual Israel. Right? So, we are priests. And the brazen labor is a picture of the sanctification of the priest. Alright? Now y'all can write these verses down and you'll see the brazen labor and the priest. Second Peter, or First Peter says it as well. I'll turn there. First Peter two. Verse nine and ten. But ye are a chosen generation. As the pastor said this Sunday, actually, a, a royal priesthood. And holy nation of peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Right? <clears throat> so he's called us out. Now, continuing on. So the will of God is our sanctification. Or as he's telling the Thessalonians, their sanctification. Continuing on to verse 3. That you should, he's going to go through the commandments, that you should abstain from fornication. Now I wrote this up here. Just to let you know that the word fornication is a lot broader than what it seems. All right? The word fornication comes from the word pornea. It's actually the word in America that we have pornography. And all it is is illicit sexual action. And you can go through and there's just all kind of a list of things. And so he's telling them to abstain from these things. Acts 15, if you want to turn there real quick. Acts 15. is He is confirming or caveat off of what was pronounced at the, the, council, uh, the council of Jerusalem. Where Paul was in Antioch. And there were Judaizers coming up. Judaizers being believers, but they still believe that you need to follow the law. You need to be circumcised. All the, um, the ritual baptisms and all the things that you needed to do to become a Jew. They said that the Gentiles had to keep these things as well. And so they went to, they went to Antioch, and they're up there preaching this stuff, and that becomes a controversy. And so they take it down to the elders in Jerusalem, who are James, uh, James and John, and they're all down there. And so they have a council, and the council is specifically, what do the Gentiles need to do? How do the Gentiles need to behave? All right? And so they end up writing a letter. And when they write the letter to the, to the church of Antioch, the Gentiles, this is what they say. For it seemed, uh, verse 28... For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. Paul is just confirming what they, they said at the Jerusalem Council, that they need to abstain from fornication. All right? Verse 4. First Thessalonians, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. What do y'all think he's talking about right here when he says vessel? Yes. Body. Body. Anybody else? Is that what everybody thinks? 
That's why I think, too, there's a lot of commentaries that believe otherwise. But the word is skueos, and it actually means yeah. an, an implement. What's an implement? Or a piece of gear or equipment. That's what the word actually means. The Lord Jesus said that Paul's going to be, he's going to use him as a vessel, right? That he's going to use him as a, he is a chosen vessel to bear the gospel to the Gentiles. So he, <laughs> he's, as you've heard it before, I am an instrument in God's hand. That's what a vessel is. We're, we are tools in God's hand. That's right. So he says that you are to possess your, his vessel, which is your body, which is yourself, in sanctification and honor. Not in lust and concus, uh, con concupiscence. Yeah, I always mess this word up. <laughs> Can anybody tell me what that word is? What that word means? Yes. Yes. And so not in lust as the Gentiles, which know not God. And then he says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. That's pretty self-explanatory. Then he says, he therefore that despises, despises not man, but despises God. Now what he's, sorry. What he's talking about right there, that word despises is reject. a word, what is it? Reject. Reject. Wow. Very good. Reject. A lot of people see, a lot of people think it means hate. But it doesn't mean hate, it means to reject or disregard. To disregard what? Let's wait. Let's wait for the baby to go. <laughs> let's read that again. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such things, or such. As we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness. But unto holiness, he therefore that despises, despiseth, despise not man, but God. Why? Despise what? He that despises what? Despises not man, but God. I would say like holiness or his commandments. You know, same thing was said to David by David. Yes. Yes, sir. So if you, if you're exactly right. So, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Say again. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Jesse. Right. So he therefore that despises, despises not man but God. He despises the forewarning and the testifying of the commandments of God. All the things that he said previously. So if they are disobeying these things, they are reject, not rejecting man for defrauding their brother. Or not abstaining from fornication. You see? Or not keeping their vessel with sanctification and honor. They're not despising man when they do that. They're despising God. They're God. rejecting God. That's what he's saying. This is a very... It's like they're at the door there and they're trying to get to the middle of the clan. And that's where we have this problem. Well, I mean, these... Obviously, the Thessalonians are saved people, right? But he is reminding them of the things that they must do as a church body. Because... As we know in this church body, there are issues that come about, right? There are things that happen. And we sometimes, some, a brother may defraud his brother, you see? And so he's reminding them, don't do these things. If you do these things, you're rejecting the ministry of the Holy Spirit and rejecting God, right? You so, know, the Ten Commandments, though, is a, it's a guideline for us. But there's no man other than the Lord Jesus Christ that ever kept all Ten Commandments. I mean, I understand that that's a, I mean, you know, you should love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with soul, and all thy mind. 
This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is likewise unto us, love thy neighbor as thyself. I think that's a guideline, but if we could walk as that Ten Commandments has told us and, sh and shared, and we never failed it, uh, we could hold hands with the Lord. But, uh, but to me, there is no way that humans are reduced to agreement to, that humans can keep every Ten Commandments that's actually mentioned in that Bible. Because we dishonor our parents periodically. We, we, that's why we're sinners, saved by grace through faith. So that, that is nothing that I would say. Not, I mean, I understand it. it's a guideline, but we and try to stay in that guideline, and it gives us a path to, to walk and to choose from. In other words, without the Ten Commandments, this is why people are over here doing what they want, and over here doing what they want, and they don't care. Mm -hmm. Because there's no Ten Commandments in their mind or their vocabulary, not at all. What well, is a... All right, let me, let me clarify a few things first. You, the pastor talked about the Ten Commandments on Sunday. I want you all to know that, and if you don't know this, the Ten, the Ten Commandments are laid out specifically. Right. All right? The first four commandments are toward God. The rest of them are toward man. Yeah. Now, I want you to think about this. The Lord Jesus, when he came, he did not... Lower the standard just because he gave you two commandments. He actually increased the standard. And what he said is, you're going to love God with all your heart, um, heart, mind, soul. And but he, what is it? Sorry, Love the Lord that God all the hearts, soul, and mind. Right, I can't think of it either. So and the second is like that too. Is I'm so love thy neighbor. Love thy neighbor as thyself. So God breaks them down in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. But the Lord Jesus sums it up in love, right? All the commandments are wrapped up in love. And that's toward God, and that's toward your neighbor. Can a human being keep all the commandments? Absolutely not. They can't. That's right. They can't. That's why the Lord Jesus had to come. Now, something very interesting is people have a hard time understanding what belief is and what faith is. Faith in Jesus Christ. I'll explain it like this. We have faith in the one who had faith. You see that? Yeah. We have faith in the one who did keep the commandments. So that's why when we get to, when we stand before God and he says, uh, this is a question, this is a, a question a lot of people use and I don't know if I should use it, but why should I let you into heaven? Right? What can we say? You shouldn't let me into heaven. There's no reason why I should be here. It's actually unfair that I am right here and that you're, you're even asking me this question. And the unfair thing is that I could not keep your commandments, but I have faith in the one who did. I hide behind him. And so when you think about faith, people often get a misunderstanding about what they have faith in. I say, and I think the word of God says, that we have faith in the one who had faith. And the one who kept the commandment. And that's who we're going to hide behind. Amen. See? So I, I said that because I, I know coming home from up north, I, I killed at least 10 people. Ain't worthy. But that's in my heart. You know, somebody driving on the road and they're on their, on their phone, they don't know you're behind them. You know what I mean? And and then on top of everything else, uh, speed limit's uh, 75 mile an hour. They upped it. But I can do 82. That's what I'm saying. It, there, there's no way, I mean, you can fight and struggle all you want to, and that guideline is there just like the laws. Without laws, we are, this world is in bad shape as it is and it's getting darker. Well, we're going to have the laws. Just, I want to do a study shape. on the inner and the outer man. The reason I want to do a study on the inner and outer man because I think it's important. Because once you're born again, John, 1 John says that the one who's born again cannot sin. So the inner man, Christ in you, the hope of glory, yeah. is in you. That's right. You can't sin. It's your outer man, yeah. your old man that sins, yeah. you see. And so when people think that they got sins of the heart and all these things, the Lord Jesus is in you. And it's the old man that continues to fight and fight and fight and fight and yeah. fight. And that's why the Lord Jesus says that you need to take up your cross daily. Yeah. Right? Oh, and so, can you take up your cross daily? Yes. And crucify the self? Yes, you can. Yes. 
every single day, you're supposed to be doing that. How are you going to do that? Well, through prayer. Through prayer. But the, through prayer. But the reality is, as we talked about this, and we're going off on a tangent, but we're going to keep going. So, remember what we talked about pro horizo. You remember, anybody remember what that is? Anybody? The word, now, I don't want everybody, sir, uh, hold on with me while, while I say <laughs> Predestination. Remember that. Predestination. The word horizo, we get our word horizon from that. And it's a boundary is what it means. This word pro means pre, pre-bound. We are predestined or pre-bound to conform to the image of his son. How's that, right, how's that going to happen? The inner man is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The outer man wants to run towards sin. Here's God's boundary. Once you are born again, he puts you in that boundary. And you want to do nothing but run out. And what's he going to do? The hope, the Lord Jesus in you is going to, once you run out, just like a little kid. We talked about the fence and the dog, right? About him trying to stretch over, you know, <laughs> over the boundary. Well, he's going to beat you back in it. He's going to get you back in there. You see, that's what's going to happen. Whether it be guilt or whatever the case may be. Whether it be you're on your deathbed or whether he, you see, that's why when we... When we're praying for healing, when we're praying for healing, I'm not telling you not to pray for healing because we want to see everybody healed. But we need to understand that these people who are on their deathbed may be there for a reason. And we need to pray God's will be done, your will be done. We want them to be healed, Lord, because we want them in our presence and we want our fellowship and we want them to see them well. But thy will be done, you see. So I just wanted to cover that because we cannot keep the commandments. He kept the commandments and that's who we have faith in. But we can crucify the flesh. And we can uh, carry a daily cross. And the way we do it is he makes sure that we do it. Yes. Uh, what was the verse uh, that is who he did foreknow? Like, where exactly is that verse? That's Romans 8. Romans, Romans 8. 8? Okay. Uh, can we like take a look at that for just a second? Yes. All right. Verse 29, okay. So, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, when I see that, when I see uh, foreknow and I see uh, predestinate, I don't see God predestinating people to salvation. Right. I see him knowing that someone is going to get saved and then predestinating them for sanctification after salvation. <clears throat> Now we can go into this, and we're not going to go too too far in this, but uh, okay, we're not going to go way 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 into this because we can get really deep into it. But is it a lot of people talk about Calvin, John Calvin, his view on predestination? All right, what I'm saying is completely different than that. All right, John Calvin, you know, it's not as I don't think it's as serious as people. If you read John Calvin, it's not as serious as people are. Taking it like John Calvin says that this it's it's this way from the beginning. It doesn't matter. God's got it like this, and it doesn't matter. Nothing's going to change. Well, if you read him, you'll see that it's not quite like that. But the actual word is prohorizo, and it means to be bound. God is going to bound. He he has already determined that he has pre-bound certain people who he did foreknow. He foreknew them. He knew them before to be conformed to the image of his son, meaning. He's going to keep you in his boundary, right? That's, all, that's what predestination is. So we're not going to go way, way too far into that, but we can do a study. I want to do a study on the inner and outer man because uh, I think a lot of people are, are mixed up about that too, about sin and about being able to keep the commandments and all that stuff. So let's continue on and we'll wrap it up here. Verse 9. So we just seen that he says, you, you don't despise man, you despise God if you do not adhere to what I'm telling you. Verse 9 says, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. For you yourselves are taught of, taught of God to love one another. Verse 10, and indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. 
Now, I want to ask y'all a question. Do y'all think that I don't, I, I don't think that they had all kind of denominations back then. When Paul was walking around and he was going to these cities, he was teaching them the same thing. He was teaching them the word of God as he was given, and he was teaching them the same thing. Now, of course, as we go through time and through history, you see all these things come up, whether it be baptism or whether it be communion or whether it's uh, how people should dress or, what, you know, how people misinterpret the word of God. You get fragmented, right? But do I think that a Presbyterian is a Christian? I do. Do I think a Methodist is a Christian? I do. You see? They may have some little different things that uh, once upon a time they said, well, we just don't believe that. We're going to go over here and start our own little group. And so he says, talking about brotherly love, and indeed you do it toward all your brethren which are in Macedonia. I encourage you that... It's not the same literally here, but as we're going out in town and, you know, we run into a Presbyterian or we run into a Methodist, don't get into an argument with them about how they baptize people, you know. <laughs> we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, all right, but um, we're supposed to love them. And so that's an example right there of what they were doing to all the brethren which are in Macedonia. All the brethren which are in three rivers, whether they're Presbyterian or Methodist, we need to Brother of the love, okay? But we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more, and that you study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded. Now, I want to end <clears throat> pretty much on this. <clears throat> um, we're going to continue on and see, and a lot of commentaries say that the reason Paul reminded them of this to be quiet, to work with their own hands, is because they were so possessed with this, parousia, the coming of the Lord, that they stopped working. That they were like, I'm done. I'm, we're we're going to sit here and we're just going to wait on the Lord. You see? And I actually have to tell you the truth. When I was first saved, I was so possessed with this that I did the same thing. I just sat around going, I'm just going to read my Bible and I'm just going to pray and I'm just going to wait on the Lord to come back. You see? But that's not. he's telling them, look, you need to continue to work. And he says that because the next verse, we'll end with this, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without. What does without mean? The lost. Unsaved. What's that? I think it's the lost. Okay, the lost? The unsaved. What, the unsaved? Okay. That, I think you're right. So the people outside the church, right? Yes. So the people outside the church who are unsaved. Walk honestly towards them. Well, is everybody at your employment saved? At your jobs, they're not. They're not all saved. So, but we still have. We still work under them. They're still our bosses, and so we need to walk honestly before them. I think that's one thing we, in the church, don't really hit on a whole lot. We kind of we talk about, and we should be talking about how we should treat the brethren and how we should be separate from the world and all these things. But when we have jobs and we we have acquaintances and things like that, we do need to walk honestly. And then it follows up and says, and that we may have lack of nothing. So we got to make, we have to make money. The world revolves around money, and the only thing that pays for my house is money. That's it. You see? <coughs> What's that? That too. I mean, God, I think God gives us what we have freely so we can help those who are in need. You see? So... I'm going to end it with this. Right there where it says, we do not, uh, let me finish up, that we may walk honestly towards them that are without. So, Paul even tells the Jews that the name of God is being blasphemed, blasphemed among the Gentiles because of them. <laughs> I believe that a lot of times that we come to the church house, we hear the word of God. But a lot of times we're not listening. And a lot of times people are just coming to show up. We've talked about that. They're just showing up to save face. I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm just going to show up and then I'm going to do my regular routine. And then they go out and the Gentiles, I'm going to say the unsaved, blaspheme the name of God because of people's lifestyle out of here. All right. There's a song. Who knows the band DC Talk? 
right? They're a pretty good band. They're older, 90s band, yeah. rock band. I used to listen to them. But um, they have a song called What If I Stumble? Yeah. You heard that? Well, the very at the beginning of the song, there's a quote, and it says this. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, then walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what, is, that is what an unbelieving world finds simply unbelievable. You see, so Paul is telling you right there in verse 12. You walk honestly when you're walking out in the world, on your jobs. Um, when you're talking to people who are unsaved, make sure that you're walking honestly and making sure you're, make sure you're working with your own hands. You're not lazy. Because people are watching you. Believe you me, in this world today, people are watching you. And I use the camera and the camcorder analogy. The world views Christians like this. We'll end with this. As a Christian is walking through the world, he's, he's trying to die to himself daily. He's trying to, to crucify the flesh and carry his cross. As he's doing that, does he slip up sometimes? Yes, he does. And so the people of the world are watching you, and when they are, they have a camera. This is an analogy. They have a camera, and every time you mess up, they snap a shot. And then you mess up again, they snap a shot. And they mess again, they snap a shot. And then what they do at the end of the day... Or at the end of the year, they put all these pictures together. And they put them all, and they make a little scrapbook and say, they come to you and say, see all this? Here's where you messed up. 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 And it makes you look like a terrible person for the whole year. But what they don't do, and if they would do this, they would see that a Christian is different. If they took a camcorder and walked behind him. That's right. right? The 24 hours a day, and they just walked behind him, they would see that for most of the day, you're doing the right thing. And then every now and then you slip up. But the world doesn't do that. They're watching you. They're watching you. So walk honestly in the world. Are there any questions? Concerns? Any questions about all the arrows on the tabernacle? No? All right. Let us pray. Lee, do you want to tell them about the verse? It's on the prayer list. Our Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for allowing us to come and um, say some things out of your word and discuss a few things. I count it as a privilege, Lord, to be able to stand up here in front of these people. I am not worthy, Lord, to be doing this, but you've allowed me to do that, and I thank you so much for that. I thank you for the people that came out today. I pray that you use the word today. Um, open our hearts and our minds. Allow us to uh, study your word with detail meditation and pondering calling out to you that you may help us um, these letters to the Thessalonians are very crucial to us Lord because it teaches us because they were a model church and I thank you for Paul Lord and the writings that you allowed him to to give to us I pray that as we leave here that we would walk in the world honestly we know that we're supposed to be separate we know that we are um, we are supposed to die to ourselves. We are supposed to crucify the flesh. But we know also, Lord, that there are people out there who are unsaved. And they are watching us. They are, they are closely keeping an eye on us and, and watching for when we fail. And I just pray that you help us as we walk out into the world, as we witness to other people, that our lives would be pleasing to you. And that we could preach the word of God uh, to these people who need it. Lord, you are worthy. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. And I pray that you protect us and our families as we leave here. I pray this in the Lord Jesus Christ's precious name.